One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Words taken from today's lesson, St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Mrs. Bernardone was heavy with child. When the hour had come for the mother to give birth to her child, it was found that the infant would not come forth. The cries of the mother were heart-rendering. The labor pains were excruciating and were extending for hour after hour after hour. Then all of a sudden, a very old gentleman, hard of hearing and blind, knocked at the door of the birthing room and soon entered. With a prophetic voice, the old man said that the child would not be born until the mother left the beautiful bedroom and went into a nearby stable. And there she would lay upon straw in one of the stalls. This was immediately done. And soon the cries of the mother ceased, and she bore a son whose first cradle, like that of our Savior, was a manger full of straw in a stable. So was the birth of an individual known as St. Francis of Assisi. This wonderful event was recorded in a writing known as the Book of Conformities, as the title would suggest. The book recounts all the ways that St. Francis of Assisi was in complete conformity with Christ, the Son of God and Son of Mary. It's so appropriate that he was to be another Christ. He who reflected the gospel of Christ so perfectly would be born in a condition similar to that of Christ in a stable. Even today, this stable has become a chapel and can be found in Assisi. It is called San Francesco il Piccolo, St. Francis the Little. And over the door can be read the following inscription, quote, This oratory was the stable of ox and ass in which Francis, the mirror of the world, was born, unquote. This coming Tuesday, October 4th, Holy Mother Church will celebrate the great feast of St. Francis of Assisi. In Thomas of Solano's hagiography of St. Francis of Assisi, it is asserted that the seraphic father and founder of the Franciscan family was chosen by divine providence to act as an ambassador, a legate, sent to bring light to people of this world and to lead them back to the pure ideals and wisdom of the gospel. Dante Alighieri, the great author of the high Middle Ages, said that the poor man of Assisi, that friar Francis, shone out like the sun. But Pope Pius XI, in one of his encyclicals, would praise St. Francis like no one before him. The Holy Father, Pius XI, wrote the following in the year 1926, quote, It seems necessary to us to affirm that there has never been anyone in whom the image of Christ and the evangelical manner of life shone forth more lifelike and strikingly than in St. Francis, unquote. He who called himself the herald of the great king was also rightly spoken of as another Christ, appearing to his contemporaries and to future generations almost as if he were the risen Christ walking on this earth. The conformity of St. Francis with Christ continued throughout the life of this holy friar, for he at first also had 12 disciples who followed him as a band of penitents witnessing to the kingdom of heaven. And unlike the revolutionary reformers who grew to despise the church that Christ founded, always condemning and haranguing against the institution, St. Francis loved his holy mother, the Church of Rome, and he reverenced the papacy like no other man before him. And St. Francis of Assisi, known as a seraphic father, due to his burning, angelic love of the Savior, had an angel-like mission that went beyond mere self-reform. The good Lord saw in Francis the needed instrument of restoration for the membership of the entire church. While at prayer before a Byzantine crucifix in a crumbling chapel known as San Damiano, just outside of Assisi, 
Francis prayed before that crucifix. And he prayed, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And eventually he received a message from the victim, the divine victim on the cross, saying, quote, now go forth, Francis, and rebuild my church, for it is nearly falling down, unquote. You see, that dilapidated chapel that he was praying in was an image of the spiritual condition of many members of the church who had lost their fervor, become lukewarm. Eventually, St. Francis would head to Rome to seek approval for a group of poor penitential friars. And upon seeing the poor friar, Pope Innocent III was convinced that this beggar from Assisi was truly sent by God. For this vicar of Christ had had a dream in which he not only saw his own cathedral in Rome, namely St. John Lateran, beginning to topple over, but he also noted a brown robe friar, the spitting image of St. Francis, putting his back to the structure, thus preventing it from collapsing. So many troubles afflicted Holy Mother Church at that time. Heresies, the denial of papal authority, and even violent attacks on Rome itself. This is certainly the man Pope Innocent claimed in seeing Francis. And by his work and teaching, he will uphold Christ's church. In the year 1215 AD, Pope Innocent III called into session the Fourth Lateran Council to deal especially with the issue of reform, to restore Europe to the state of holiness, to confront and correct abuses, to revive Christendom, and to put down falsehoods, heresies. And Francis attended that council. And he listened to the opening sermon of the Pope, and it greatly influenced him for the rest of his life. With great fervor and zeal, Pope Innocent III recalled the famous prophecy and vision of Ezekiel. The Pope remarks saying, quote, approach you who watch over the city, every one of you with his weapon and destruction in hand. And I saw six men approaching from the upper gate with faces which faces the north, every one with a deadly weapon in his hand. And in the midst of them stood a man clad in linen with a writer's inkhorn at his belt. And the Lord said to him, go through Jerusalem and mark with the sign of the Tau the foreheads of all those men who weep and lament over the abominations which are done in it. And he said to the others, pass through the city after him and smite, show no pity, but spare and slay not those upon whom you shall see the mark of the towel. Pope Innocent then observed, and who are the six men charged with divine vengeance? They are you, the fathers of this council, who with all the arms at your disposal, excommunications, suspensions, interdicts, shall smite without pity those unmarked with the atoning cross who persist in dishonoring the city of Christendom, unquote. It would be Francis and his band of friars that would play a major role in instituting this reform under the image of the Tau cross. Pope Innocent III stated that the Tau, that is a capital T, has exactly the same form as the cross on which our Lord was crucified at Calvary. And only those will be marked with this sign and will obtain mercy who have mortified their flesh and conformed their life to that of the crucified Savior. And as that Tau was the emblem of reform for the Pope, so it would be for Francis. He used it in the signature of his letters. He painted the Tau cross upon his door. For Francis truly believed that his mission was to be one of the scribes with an inkwell at his belt to sign people with that mark of the Tau to convert people before the time of destruction and judgment. But the complete conformity of St. Francis with the master that is Christ would be realized with the miracle of a stigmata. Francis would become obedient unto death, even the mystical death of the cross. 
And while meditating upon the passion of Christ, while on retreat on Mount Alverna, St. Francis saw a vision of a six-winged seraphim that bore the image of a crucified man. And soon, in his very hands, Francis saw, as well as in his feet and side, marks like nails beginning to appear, that the heads of the nails were within the palms of the hands and the top of the feet, and the points of the nails were on the backs of the hands and under the feet. And in the left side, the image of a lance thrust appeared, red and bleeding, the stigmata. When Francis returned to the friary, he was unable to hide this miracle. The other friars soon noticed that Francis's habit and clothes were bloody when they went to wash them. They then understood that he bore the very marks, the wounds of Christ, the image and likeness of Christ crucified. But you know, this wondrous story of this most beautiful saint has been hijacked. Revolutionaries in both the secular realm and in the realm of the church have perverted the true story of Francis and have co-opted this saint into their revolutionary agenda. These individuals portray him now as some sort of environmentalist only of the Middle Ages, a flower child, a tree hugger, whose statue belongs in a flower garden more than it belongs in a dusty old church building. Others today see Francis as some ideologue, a social justice warrior, a community organizer, an agitator, an activist, a Marxist revolutionary, a promoter of the rainbow agenda, and a nonconformist, a critic of anything institutional, and a leader of an ecumenical interreligious dialogue. Use Francis as a weapon to change. But this would be a most improper view of this poor, simple friar. St. Francis called himself the herald of Christ the King during that age of faith and beyond. He was a knight of his Lord and Master, and he was a spiritual and loyal subject, a vassal that swore complete fealty, obedience to his King and Lord. And he also swore obedience to his kingdom, his mystical body, which is only the Roman Catholic Church. And because of Francis's complete, utter subjection to the King of Kings, all of nature, including the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and everything living on dried land was subject to Francis. Because this friar never rebelled against the good Lord and his law, Animals did not rebel against Francis. Rather, the beast served him, including a little lamb that followed him wherever he chose to go. What happened then? How was Francis stolen from us? What contributed toward this remaking of Francis into some leftist agitator? Well, the answer is found in a most influential book entitled The Life of St. Francis by a Frenchman named Paul Sabatier. This first modern biography written in the year 1893 portrays Francis as a pacifist, a voice thundering against clericalism and demanding more involvement of the laity in ministry, a liberal promoting ecology rather than the icon of piety and devotion an anti-institutional prophet calling for a new age of the spirit, a defender of free thinking and freedom of conscience which trumped the authoritative teachings of the church, and a supporter of ecumenical dialogue that would precede a Assisi-like prayer days. The author Sabatier downplays St. Francis's utter obedience to the Church of Rome and her Pope. Instead, Sabatier emphasizes St. Francis' supposedly subversive actions, challenging prophetic words of the church. As Sabatier put it in his book, quote, Francis of Assisi is preeminently the saint of the Middle Ages, owing nothing to the church 
or school, he was truly theodidactic. And if he perhaps did not perceive the revolutionary bearing of his preaching, he at least always refused to be ordained a priest. He divined the superiority of the spiritual priesthood. He continues, there was a genuine attempt at religious revolution, which if it had succeeded, would have ended in a universal priesthood, no more hierarchy, and the proclamation of the rights of the individual conscience, unquote. In the end, however, Paul Sabatier's book on the topic of Francis was most unsound, erroneous, and totally unhistorical. In fact, the book was placed in the index of forbidden books, which we had at one time. When our present Holy Father took the name Francis at the start of his papacy, he was sending a message. His would be a papacy of reformation and not maintaining the status quo. But we have to ask if the choice of Francis for a name was inspired by the real St. Francis or by a false caricature of the poor friar as put out by Paul Sabatier. Audato Z, a writing focusing on ecology by our Holy Father. Amoris Laetitia, focusing on marriage and even the possibility of public adulterers receiving the sacraments with their conscience trumping the moral law. Assisi prayer days with non-believers continuing on unabated. Rantings against clericalism and promoting laity to clerical roles. And the planned destruction of the ancient Roman mass and rituals as a relic of a bygone age that no longer expresses the law of prayer in the church. All this suggests that the real St. Francis of Assisi is not the guiding light of this papacy, but rather the Francis portrayed by Paul Sabatier. As our Holy Father stated not too long ago, quote, there is no need to create another church, but to create a different church, unquote. But the real St. Francis of Assisi may have warned us of this false and chastising spirit in centuries past. Shortly before he died, St. Francis of Assisi called together his followers and prophetically warned them of coming troubles by saying, quote, some preachers will keep silence about the truth and others will trample the truth underfoot and deny the truth. Sanctity of life will be held in derision, even by those who outwardly profess it. For in those days, Jesus Christ will send them not a true pastor, but a destroyer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.